What's up guys? Welcome back to the Mastery Podcast. I hope you're all doing well. Now, I am delighted to be joined today by my good friend and incredible coach, Dan Lawrence. Second time on the podcast. Repeat offender. Thanks for having me back, Mark. My pleasure. My pleasure. Now guys, in today's episode, we want to get into high performance. Dan talked about high performance last time, but we're going to do it with a bit of a twist because I come across so many fitness professionals, rightly so, who would love to work with leaders. They'd love to work with high performance people and even athletes, but they kind of have no idea really of what it takes to kind of get to that point. They want to throw it on their bio. They want to tell people on YouTube that they work with high performers and it's not really happening for them. And you have an incredible journey, incredible story of kind of what's got you to the point that you are incredibly well known for working with high performers in business and high performers in sport. So for everybody watching and listening to the podcast, we just give us a little bit of an idea of your journey through your career, just to give everybody a better understanding that you started off where, like I did, where a lot of the other coaches listening to this did. But what's your journey been so far as a coach? Yeah, so I actually started, it seems like many moons ago, and I suppose it was nearly 17 years I've, I've been a practitioner and started in the private sector in the Virgin Active days. And uh, we moved through a couple of couple of gyms, we went to Twickenham Rugby Stadium, Virgin Active there. I think we opened that in October 2009, if memory serves me correctly. And uh, I then started my own business, Dan Lawrence Athletic Performance, I think it was at the time. I then did that for a few years before then moving into the brand, which is now Perform365. And have just yet worked consistently to improve myself as a practitioner, as a person, as a communicator, and obviously have upskilled myself throughout that process as well. And I'm now bringing it to the present day, have the pleasure of coaching over 30 champions across multiple sports, work with NFL Super Bowl winners, undisputed world boxing champions. I work with a number of Premier League footballers and uh, just very blessed for where I'm at now. But uh, yeah, it's been a, been a journey for sure. And if you'd have told me 17 years ago that I'd be doing what I'm doing now, I you know, probably would have laughed at you. So I think with a lot of hard work and maybe a bit of luck along the way as well, you know, here we are now and I'm loving every single day of it. Well, my job is to delve into that bit of luck, bit of hard work, because <laughs> that's the bit that we're all gonna, I'm gonna disagree on you, with you is the same for me, is there has to be some conscious intent at some way along the way to move you along. And I'm interested to know, Virgin, trainer, I remember my days at LA Fitness, trainer, there was something inside of you that was driving you to move into that athletic arena and then create your own athletic performance company and obviously now is obviously Perform365. What was kind of happening for you at that stage, which maybe the, you know, the, the listeners and viewers will relate to, what's been going on in your head that's kind of been your driver in terms of your service and we all know that a lot of coaches get challenged by what's going on around them. Like you must have had it in the gym in Virgin. Like not everyone in the gym is a great trainer. So where were these kind of standards and high performance kind of skill sets coming from? Were they ingrained? Are they from family? Are they, is it something you've watched in other people? I think you've got to identify what resonates best with you as well, Mark. And at that time, you've got to go through the process. I have to do my hard yards of, you know, coaching everyday athletes, as I like to call them, general population clients and, you know, getting some good results, but then also realizing that not every single one of them has the, the standards that you upkeep every single day yourself. And that can become quite demoralizing as a coach at the time is that if you hold people to the highest of standards and they don't then deliver, you then have to question you know, whether you're in the right environment to allow you to thrive. And yes, I had to go through the apprenticeship, should we call it, you know, in those days. But now I've formulated my own systems and standards that I live and breathe by on a day-to-day -day basis. And I expect my athletes and, and others, you know, in the corporate setting, business individuals to adhere to as well. And I think you have to go through that process because now those individuals that I do work with, it's, it kind of comes back to they're drawn to me and I'm drawn to them because we all hold each other to the highest of standards. And yeah, that's probably... Uh, and, and, and when you were at Virgin, did you have... Like, it's always a question that you know, coaches ask me in, inside our programs. Were you always a high performer? Did you always have high standards? You know, we, 
you know, back in party days, clearly we, it was more of a priority and, you know, we both had those days. What was the catalyst that kind of gave you the, the kind of drive to say, no, no, I'm going to start putting some standards in place. Mm. And surely those standards that you put in place were the catalyst for wanting to move yeah. forward. W was there something in your life that you started to watch here or someone around you that influenced you? You know, to just give people an understanding of what have they got to do potentially now to start having the penny drop that, that standards are important? Firstly, I'd say, Mark, I definitely didn't live my life the way I live my life now. Yeah, I think you know, that's comforting for people to know, right? Yeah. Because I think people think, like, you're just born with high standards. It's like... I think you live your life a certain way, and I, I absolutely had standards. They may not have been the highest of standards as they are now, but you have to go through that process to identify what works for you. And then again, it goes back to, if we go a little bit deeper into the goal setting process and your longer term vision and your values and vision drive every decision. And unless you have, so when you have clarity with that, are your standards either aligned or misaligned with that? And at the time they were probably misaligned with where I'm looking to go now, but you have to go through that process. And it goes back to the Japanese verb case and constant never ending improvements. You're constantly evolving and trying to get better day in, day out. And at that time, I you know probably had mediocre standards, but you know I was young, and yeah, yeah, yeah. that wasn't my main priority. I'm certainly not going to apologise for that, but it does now form where I'm at today. And it was a, you know through those formative years that allow me to kind of do what I do on a daily basis now, and allow me to live the life of you know high standards and high performance. And were you following anybody? Were you learning from anybody? Because do you know what? I'll I'll say this for the record of the podcast. My father, incredible man, ran his business, loved him dearly. Um, but, you know, he had certain standards in certain areas of his life and his business. But one person that was impactful to me in my personal training career was going and watching Charles Poliquin and standing in front of him and going, okay, there's some traits as a fitness professional that he has that I like, I resonate with. And I'm, for a short while, I kind of modeled myself a little bit before I realized it wasn't true me, truly me. Mm. But even though my, I got my work ethic from watching my father, work ethic, and then I got Charles Poliquin and I watched the, uh, Charles had very, very high standards for results and very, very high standards for constant learning. And I came out of school and was, wasn't a learner at all. But when I watched Charles and he said, you should be reading books, constantly you should be listening to mp3s at the time then it was show my age but there was learning and he, sh and he said learning you'll fill the gaps get great results you'll get well known be in great shape you'll stand out three things and I went hmm, I got to follow that right so that really impacted me at the age of 24 what impacted you from virgin into your own athletic business because I, I really do believe that when you're latching on to someone that's impacted you in some way, they make an impact. So what, what happened if you, to you around that verge in your own business at the time? It's a great question, Mark, and it's really got me thinking. And two things that come to mind is, first of which, <laughs> you're saying about MP3, someone, I think it was at the Virgin days or maybe prior, lent me a six CD cassette or whatever it was. CDs, I think they were, they weren't quite cassettes. Um, and it was Tony Robbins. Wow. I can't recall the name of it, but it was Tony Robbins, six CDs. And I used to listen to them every single day on the way to work. Wow. But also, and this is the second point that I think now has shaped it in terms of where I'm at, in terms of the standards that I keep and the structure that I'd required was boxing. Right. So I boxed at the time. I'm actually out in Dubai now as we film this with my friend Joe Ackery, who's got a gym out here, Box IQ. And together we went every single week, I think it was three times a week, to Westside Boxing Gym with John Holland. Um, and that really shaped us. And looking back, I never really thought about that, the importance of that, having three days a week, going there, that structure, going in there, there's, it's a no BS mentality of just getting it, getting it done. There's no egos. If you've got an ego, you've got to leave it at the door and just doing the work. So I think that and the fact that I did really immerse myself with the Tony Robbins uh, CDs very early on, those two things probably gave me more exposure to, okay, what is possible with the Tony Robbins side mm -hmm. of things? Ah, oh, right, having a growth mindset and absorbing this information actually may mean that I can then improve and absorb that and then become better. So then that opens a different angle and, and uh, door, so to speak, in terms of improving and having that growth mindset. But then the structure and systems from the boxing side of things 
uh, something that I bring into my day to day now. And do you think uh, personal development, I mean, you and I are both fascinated by the whole idea of personal development. Was it around from a family perspective? Certainly in my family, it wasn't there. So who, what introduced you to Tony Robbins and the whole idea of personal self-improvement? Very good question. And I can't give a definitive answer. I can certainly say from the family side, there wasn't that leader in place um, to add the structure like your father. So that wasn't there. What, maybe just a, an inquisitive questioning everything mentality that I've always had may have opened that door to say, here's these CDs, you know, why, why do I want to take those CDs and listen to them? It's quite a hard question for me to answer because we're going back about 16 years yeah, now. Of course, of course. And, um, but I do know that it wasn't like one guy took me under his wing and said, do this. In fact, you know what, thinking about that, there was a man, there was a guy, Darren Lafferty, at my first ever Virgin Active about 15 years ago. He's an NLP practitioner. And uh, wow. he, he was my first, sorry guys, the light bulbs are going off now. He was my first exposure to NLP, yeah. to that mindset. So he was the catalyst for change. He was the guy who put it on my radar that then probably 18 to 24 months later, I actually picked up those CDs and started listening to them. So yeah, Darren Laverty. Well, check this out. And I love the fact your, your light bulb's just gone. But my first introduction to personal development was NLP as well. Wow. Because I started working with a, uh, a lady, Jane. Uh, and if anyone's read my book, you'll know I talk about Jane. But she said to me that you can have anything that you want in your life. And I said, that's absolute crap people are dealt a certain hand and you're dealt that and that's what you get. That's what my fixed mindset yeah. at the time. And she said, no, it's not. It's not the case. And after a while, and I fell out with her on her view on life, her growth mindedness really challenged me. And she said, read this and asked me to read the secret. <laughs> and I, it, I was exposed to the same thing. Right. Yeah. And she said, I did some NLP with her when she started to study it. I read the secret and I went, this is still hocus pocus, I called it at the time. But let's submerge myself in it. You submerged yourself in the work with Darren, right? Mm. And learned this. And then it exposed you to something. And I think it's very important that we kind of acknowledge at that time in our life that there's always somebody trying to guide us. Mm. I think if we, you, you've looked into Darren right now, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think what comes to my mind is environment dictates outcomes. And it might be maybe for some listening that the environment might not be right for you to then spark the light bulb off to then question certain things that are going on. And for me, Darren, and probably the, the lady Jane, I think you said with you, Mark, is she challenged you a little bit. Very she showed so. you something that may have been slightly different to the environment and the way you live your life at that present moment in time. Yeah. And then I suppose it's down to you as an individual to be questioning that and saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to explore that further. Or again, Carol Dweck, fixed first growth mindset. Are you going to be fixated in the way of doing things and thinking you cannot change? Or are you going to say, actually, I'm going to absorb that information. I'm going to see how I go with that. And then maybe I'm going to then ask more questions or read more books and listen to a little bit more of that and see where it takes me. And uh, yeah, look, you know, I'm a firm believer like yourself in, in Cara Dweck's research of, of growth mindset. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, that opened up the way to possibilities. And maybe I don't need to be at Virgin maybe I could create my own thing. What was that stepping stone from Virgin into creating your own performance business? I think I became very disillusioned with life at Virgin. And this probably goes back to your question around the standards and the way I live my life is that it was a vital part of the process. Yeah. You know, I completely appreciate that for what it was and looking back now. But I was then dragging my heels and realizing that the standards just weren't aligned with how yeah, I lived my life. Well, right? yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe so, maybe so. You know, I don't want to throw shade on that that business <laughs> too much but yeah maybe i did um as i say it was a vital part of the process but maybe i did outgrow it at times and realize that there was a misalignment with how i want to live my day to day and you know what they had there so that then became the birth of yeah my business then which was i think dan La i think it was dan lawrence training prior to dan lawrence athletic performance um going back um again really struggling to, th to think back but I, I had a mini cooper s club man and I had some weights in the back. I had it logoed up and, uh, and I was driving around to a few people. I had a few gyms that I was coaching at as well. And, uh, and yeah, that was the, the next step post Virgin Active days. What would your advice be? Because it's a very similar story to mine in that I was at LA Fitness and I became not disillusioned. I never have a problem with where I was at. I just felt that I was ready for something better in my opinion. 
and obviously moving into your Mini Cooper, what would you say to anybody that is in an environment right now that in their head they go, I know something better is out there. I know I've got to push myself. It's very uncomfortable. You did it from Virgin. You set up your own thing. What would your advice be to somebody that knows they're kind of at that little sticking point right now where they know there's something better, but they're just frightened to make that jump? I think you can do a small task with yourself. I'm not going to come on here, Mark, and say, oh, yeah, go and take the plunge right away. We're living in a world you've, you've probably got family, you've got financial constraints, you've got all of these things that you have to factor. So this isn't going to be a hoo-ha you know, hype man chat to say, go and do it. I think you need to be analytical with it. I think firstly, well done for questioning everything and thinking there is something better out there for you. So I commend that. But I'd say maybe do a very small task, pros and cons, line down the middle and see what, well, whether that next step is, uh, is really as good as it may feel and mm -hmm. seem, or whether your current position is actually more negative than positive. And, you know, see whether you're willing to make that mm -hmm. change. And then if you are, then you put the steps in place to make that change. So then you need to build the right connections. You need to speak to the right people and start building a system of how you're going to get there. Well, this leads really nicely into, because the whole idea of today's episode, which is working with high performers and leaders, on your way through this journey from having your Mini Cooper um, to having Perform365, which is now your company, and actually being able to work with incredible athletes and business professionals, has there been an intentional thought process to analyze your standards and high performance habits that you feel you've been doing for a long period of time that's now put you into today's position? Without doubt. I'd say over the past six or seven years, I've been very aware and conscious about how I live my day to day. I think that's been accelerated over the past two years. And I do have to now, because of time constraints on everything, I have to live my life of high performance and standards and execute every moment of every day with the numerous arms of the business and the athletes who can become quite demanding at times. You know, I have to bring my best self to every moment and every conversation and uh, I have to live by the highest of standards. Wow. And, and to anybody listening to this, right, there's a lot of people uh, and watching this, there's a lot of people that want to work with high performers. I'm going to get into the high performers that you're working with and the kind of standards that they hold and how you help them to get to where they are. But what are some of the behaviors and standards that you chose six or seven years ago? And I, I want to know, firstly, why you chose six or seven years ago that they had to change to be able to be in the position you're in now because there was some clear intent mm. to say, I want to get to somewhere. Because I think a lot of people, I'll come back to the question in a second, a lot of people actually want to get somewhere, but they don't put a strategy in place to get somewhere. Mm. I know that there's been intent to deliver great results, great standards, great service that's helped me get to where I am today. At that six or seven years ago point, did you say to yourself, I've got a goal? to actually be recognized and be someone? Because there's a lot of people that want to be someone. Mm. But that six to seven years ago, did you make a conscious intent, right? I'm going to change the way I do stuff now. I'm not going to be unrealistic in, uh, you know, it's going to take six months. But what, what was it that you did six or seven months, years ago that's, that's actually got you to here? I'd say the prior time before the six or seven years ago, before I was very consciously aware of how I live my day to day, that was still necessary to get me to make that switch. And I, I say switch, but it wasn't like this huge transition. It was just being more consciously aware of it. So from 17 years of being a practitioner, the first four or five years, I probably wasn't aware of it at all. Mm -hmm. And then you are aware of it. So then you play around with that for three or four years. And then you get to a point of saying, I now really appreciate these standards and how you live your day to day. And I also see that there's a huge alignment with that and the longer term vision and goal. And to go back to the question there, Mark, is over the six or seven years that have been, are your standards aligned or misaligned with where you're looking to go? And that's fundamental because we all have goals. And I liken this to, let's say an elite level athlete, if we have a fight and let's say the, the goal is to become world champion on X date, we get given the fight, we reverse engineer the process and we put the steps in place to reach that said outcome. Well, your standards and how you live your day to day the question maybe for the listeners would be, okay, what is the goal first and foremost? And we can talk about goal setting if you so wish. And then are my standards and how I live my day to day either aligned or misaligned with reaching that goal? And that can be a nice little task for, for people to carry out. What standards do you have to have 
let's say six, let's say somebody's watching this, listening to this right now, that is Dan Lawrence seven years ago, right? You're at that point where you go, I actually want to be working with high performance athletes. I think the desire to, to want them now when you haven't done the work is a bit crazy for a lot of people. But if you want six to seven years down the line to be in your position, working with elite level athletes, working with wealthy, successful business people, what are some of the things that somebody would need to do right now to be where Dan Lawrence is today? And what are these kind of high performance standards that high achievers expect mm. of people like you? Yeah, I think having a look at how you live your day to day to see that, okay, if you are walking into a meeting with, let's say, a CEO of a global company, are they going to respect you? Are they, how you communicate, what you wear, how you carry yourself, how you posture, you know, your timekeeping and all of these small things that are done as single entities might not seem like a lot to most, but you bring them all together, you do them every single day consistently. And when you're in that meeting, you present yourself in a certain way to command respect from that individual then that prepares you for that moment. Yeah. So the six or seven years ago and the constant never ending improvements of trying to get better in every aspect of what I do, and I'm not just talking as a practitioner, I'm talking around other areas of it in how I live my day to day, then get me prepared and ready to execute in those moments. So now you've talked about obviously your athletes, your high performance. This is something that comes up very frequently with uh, younger fitness professionals or fitness professionals wanting to work with elite level people. They're desperate to work with the elite level people rather than being grateful for the people they're working with right now. Now I'm sure you work with amateur boxers. I'm sure you work with amateur sports people. I'm sure you work with less financially successful mm -hmm. business people. How important is that journey and being prepared right now to do the, the dirty grind mm -hmm. and to work with people that no one knows to eventually get the opportunity to work with somebody like essentially right now the work that somebody has to do six or seven years ago or you had to do you're not working with known and you've got to do the work now to be able to work that stepping stone through amateur to professional to elite so how important was those stages of grounding yourself and saying it's okay to be here right now do you, you know you've what got mean? to do the reps right it's like anything you know you don't reach the summit of the mountain without climbing it first you've got to start where you stand and do the do the work every single day to then get you closer to your goal of course you have to re you have to set the goal first and foremost so once you have clarity with where you're going you can then put the steps in place to reach it and for me those formative years and i should actually add to the listeners six seven years ago i, I was working with the heat athlete i was working with george groves 10 years ago and he was kind of my my big break after working with amateur fighters and other boxers um, so i went through the journey with him but there was six years prior to that, that you've got to do the, now I may look back and say hard yards, and you've got to do the reps. But that's important. You don't, as I say, you don't get to those, and sometimes you may get lucky, but those doors don't open unless you do the hard yards and you are consistent. And don't become downbeat of where you're at now. Appreciate that, because it might be that you can achieve more later down the line, but you've got to do the work there and then to reach the outcome. Have you, have you always had a long mindset like a long-term mindset that that you're really happy with what you're doing because i think it's important to enjoy what you're doing today to, to 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 deserve tomorrow and have you always had a like i'm in this for the long game yeah i am a macro level thinker and there was certain moments throughout the course of my career mark so i can't recall exactly when uh, i can't remember what i had for breakfast but i can't recall exactly when this was but I got approached for a role at bxr in marlebone when they were opening an incredible gym state-of-the-art gym in marlebone and from a financial monetary level, it was taking a pay cut in the short term. But then on a macro level, it was giving me exposure to the types of individuals that I knew I could help and could potentially open doors for me. So it's a different type of client. And is that important for somebody to understand that whilst there may be a slight pay cut to get you in front of the right environment, let's stay on environment for a mm. second, it, that's a wise thing for people to do. Because I think people are chasing, especially at the moment, Everybody's chasing the, the cash, the money, and what's going to get me the money now. What you did, which was very interesting, is my father always used to say to me, be grateful to get paid to learn. And sometimes what you did, you took that pay cut at BXR to actually get you in the, the Marleybone environment of the right people. So you come back to environment. You said this 10 minutes ago, that the environment's key. And it's being prepared to potentially take a pay cut mm. to actually get yourself in that environment. Am I right? It is, yeah. Well, it was for me for sure. So I think I agreed to three days there and 
I knew I was good at what I did. I, I'd worked with George Groves, I'd worked with some other athletes at the time. I'd you know, had a successful coaching business. But geographically, I wasn't where I needed to be at that time. So I thought, okay, longer term vision is what it was at the time. I can do three days a week there. I can still bring you know, the financial requirements in from the other arms of my business on the other days. But let's go there. Let's immerse myself in that environment for not just the opening of the doors to a different type of clientele, but also to become a better practitioner as well. You know, BXR, I partnered with CHHP, the Centre of Health and Human Performance. I knew they had very good practitioners there. Doug Tannehill, an osteopath, was the guy who got me involved. And, uh, you know, it led to me becoming a better practitioner as well at the time. So it was ticking multiple boxes for me that were aligned with my core values. Um, you know, the monetary side is, is one area, but that's, that's certainly not the main driver for me. Mm -hmm. Becoming a better practitioner and, you know, becoming better every single day in, in how I deliver is, is of the utmost importance to me. So then being immersed in an environment that allows me to do that and going back to the environment dictates outcomes was, was very, very important. So, yeah, that was me looking at things on a macro level. And I believe that the here and now, Mark, is that people do just chase the quick, you know, okay, quick cash, quick wins as opposed to looking at things on a slightly longer term. And having that mindset, which I know you do, based on reputation, is everything. You've spent a long time crafting your, your structuring and designing your craft as a professional. I do see nowadays that a lot of people want to try and buy, bypass the craft, mm. the professionalism, the service delivery, the consistency, and above all else, the results that the people are paying you for. You've had a long time in this career so far. Like, what do you think it's about your coaching and what you do as a coach? Because we're talking, yeah, working with high performers, it's nice to have, it's a mm. nice to have. But what's got you here is the coach. So could you talk through a few of the high performance standards that you as a coach have employed and put in place over the last seven to 10 years that you feel have been the most catalytic as in terms of helping you to get to where you are? Yeah, like my standards can be as simple as always turning up on time or early, always being prepared, being proactive and not reactive. And that for many practitioners listening, it goes without saying, you must have obviously your sessions planned, you must have the overall training block for planned, you must go very deep and in depth with the goal setting process. And I find through a coaching business that I have uh, for, for practitioners is that unless we get super clear with our goals, then people will fall off course. They'll hit a hump in the road and then they'll just crumble. Whereas if you know, we know it's not a linear path, uh, this kind of high performance journey and whatever your goals are, that when you hit a hump, how do you overcome that? And that comes back to being super clear with your vision and goals and then executing on a day-to-day -day basis. So yes, yeah, standards wise are, I cannot expect the highest of standards from my athletes and clients unless I'm adhering to those standards myself. Mm -hmm. So if I'm turning up with poor posture, if I'm turning up not communicating in the right way, if I'm turning up and I'm just not in the room from an energy point of view, then how can I expect the people that I'm coaching to be of the mm -hmm. same standards? Mm -hmm. You're only, you're only as good as what the standards that you, so if I set my standards to a certain level, if I then allow those standards to become lower by, for example, someone turning up 15 minutes late, and I accept that, you're only willing, your standards are only as high as what you're willing to accept. And that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. So how you deliver your day to day is then an outward reflection of how others then perceive you and how they, whether they want to work with you or not. Now you walk, talk, eat, sleep, training, sleep, rest, recovery for yourself. You yeah. actually live as a high performer yourself. Mm. And I come across, you will come across a lot of fit pros that have this desire because they like the idea of working with high performers. But we see it's not something that they do every day. Now there will be people saying, yeah, you don't need to do it as much as you do your athletes. Now I watch you work with top athletes. I see the level of respect that they have for you. I see you on social media doing the hard graft, doing the odds. I remember working with some ice hockey players and I wanted to do the box jumps a little bit more than they could. Mm. Uh, it was just the thing mm. inside of me that was like, I want to be, be able to do it and show them. Mm. Now that's me personally. I know there's a lot of strength coaches that don't. How important is it to you for you to be a walking, talking billboard for what you expect of other people? It's very important. I think with the athletes that I coach, you know, they're all younger than me now, the majority of them are. I think you have to 
live your life of high standards and be seen to be practicing what you preach because then they resonate with you more. And again, it goes back to if I'm demanding a certain level from them, for me, I have to show that level myself and it might not be quite as, with the box jumps, I'm certainly not jumping as high as some <laughs> these days, I hardly get off the ground, but, um, but at least they see me doing the work, you know, and it goes back to our four pillars of high performance at Perform365 are training, nutrition, recovery, and mindset. And for me, I carry out my day to day with alignment of those four pillars. And hopefully there's an outward reflection of that, whether it be on a snippet of what's going on on socials or what my athletes see and how I deliver and live my life on a day-to-day basis. Love that. I think it was eight years ago for me. So I would not even, in fact, we tried in uh, Miami to <laughs> do a box jump. Yeah. That'd be quite embarrassing relative to I athletes you're doing nowadays. doing yourself a disservice. Wow. I will say guys, Mark absolutely crushed the box jump. And then we increased the height as well, and he stuck the landing <laughs> like a pro. The athlete, the rugby player was uh, coming out. Achilles didn't say it in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. Now, I want to I move this into high-performance business professionals and the elite-level athletes that you work with, right? When you move into that arena when you first start to work with somebody, how do you identify how to get the best out of somebody who's already achieving high performance in so many areas of their life? Yeah, great question. And what I say when I got the head of performance and matchroom role near on five years ago now is that they were winners and champions before I set foot in that gym. So they had standards already set from yeah. Tony So Sims. it's working with somebody with them already there. Yeah. How do we then take them to the next level? I think it's identifying, again, going back to the goal setting process, is okay, what are our goals and how we live our day to day? Is that either aligned or misaligned with those goals? And believe it or not, even for some of those boxers at the elite level, still winning at the time, there were certain areas that we could absolutely improve. Um, there were low-hanging fruits there that we could improve and we did to move the needle. So I think it's identifying what they do on a day-to-day basis is really important to really take a deep dive into that and then seeing whether there is anything there that you can improve, which there always is, um, and then working out a strategy and getting the buy-in from those individuals of how together cohesively you can reach those goals. Well, you see a lot, of, a lot of coaches would get startled by talking to a, you know, highest elite level athlete. They'll go in, they'll see, and they'll be like, mm. you're strong, you're healthy, you're okay. I remember working with a rugby player years ago uh, at the elite level, and I said, let me just test left and right hamstring. Mm. And one of them was like 25% of the other one. I was like, no one spotted this. Mm. And the interesting thing with that is just like, I wouldn't have wanted to test that because you make the assumption yeah. that everything's bang on because they're at the elite level. So when you go in at this elite level, for anybody listening or watching to this who aspires, like, do you go You go straight into the basics and just say, are they all in place? Yeah. And that's what you're saying, that they're very often not. So what are, what are some of the basics? Whether or not you're working with a CEO of a global company, um, whether you're working with an elite level athlete, what's your kind of baseline evaluation that you'll look at yeah. that will say, I know I'm going to be able to add 2% to you. The basics for me, and sorry to regurgitate information here, the basics come back to our four pillars, and I will delve deeper into them. Training, nutrition, recovery, and mindset's our fourth pillar, which for me is the glue that holds the other three together. So there are foundational pillars that then we build from. And unless we have those in place, everything else, in my opinion, is irrelevant. So training, let's look at that piece. And we won't go specific whether it's an athlete or corporate, but we might look at gym-based work, we might look at energy system development, whatever that is that's aligned with a longer-term goal. We don't need to spend too long on training. Nutrition. Now I'll flip it to the athletes because boxers don't fight unless they make weight. So nutrition is the up, of the utmost importance. Not every day can be a high day from a fueling point of view. We have to look at uh, Dr. James Morahan's research from Liverpool John Moores University of fuel for the work required. We have to fuel certain sessions, high days, sparring, S&C, let's say. Then on lower days, maybe just some lower level energy system work or some technical boxing work, mm. we then have to pull back and manipulate nutrition, which will then make sure that they make weight uh, the day before fight night. Then the third one is recovery. And we know the biggest recovery tool out there that costs absolutely nothing, Mark, is sleep. And is sleep being optimized? Because looking at the training piece, we look at stressor, recovery, adaptation. Stressor being a training stress, recovery, we know, Adaptation, improvements. If they're not getting that middle piece in terms of sleep optimization, they're not going, we're not going to elicit the adaptation mm-hmm. that we're looking to achieve to improve that athlete, client, whatever it may be. 
So then we obviously have to take a deep dive into sleep optimization. And are we creating the optimal sleep environment? Are we looking at our phones 10 minutes before bed that impacts, you know, the blue light explosion minute, uh, impacts melatonin production, which can then impact sleep? And then do we put the systems in place to best mitigate and not allow them to do that to then improve and optimize sleep? And then mindset. We look at, we have various systems in place to improve mindset, whether it be podcasts, audio books, books, or just having engaging conversations with the right people. Mm -hmm. So they are our foundational pillars. And I explain them in this way that may seem very basic to some, but no one is above the basics. And unless you have those basics and foundations in place, everything else for me is irrelevant. And is this, is this a way that you are able to command the respect? I mean, look, I think the respect is earned by the fact that 99% of yours will be referral to you mm. because of who you are. But when you're sitting down with an elite, you know, a corporate professional or an elite level athlete, do you get the buy-in straight away? What, get, what, how, how do you get the buy-in from them? Yeah. I mean, obviously they have very, very high goals. They've got success in other areas. How do you get that buy-in? I think from my end, complete transparency, I'm quite fortunate now because of the work that I have done that gets me in the room, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I think that gets me having the conversations with the right people and knowing that I have a body of work that will kind of get that buy-in anyway, but I had to go through a process obviously to get to this level. So going back to standards, you know, let's go through some of those again in a very simplistic way is turning up on time, how you present yourself. And I'm talking, you know, if you're going into a room with a CEO of a global company, you know, are you going in there with a pen and pokey notepad or are you going in there with a laptop or iPad? You know, are you going in there with a a bag flung over your shoulder or are you going in there with a briefcase style bag? You know, I know it sounds really silly, but these uh, are the th- uh, perceptions, the everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're, they're the, you know, again, got to cater for your environment and, you know, they're going to be judging you in, in everything that you do and say. So give yourself the best opportunity with how you present yourself in those situations. Then listen, of course, but also, and you said something there, how do you not become overwhelmed by going in with these elite level athletes? I've never become overwhelmed or... Uh, you know, it, they're just people at the end of the day. And that's the way it has to be. And that's easier said than done. I get that for some, but I've always been that way from every athlete and individual that I've been exposed to. And I've been exposed to some, some pretty cool people, but you have to hold your own. And you don't go in there with a bull in a china shop mentality. You have to listen, listen first, identify, you know, where are you at and where would you like to go? Mm-hmm. And then unpack that information to best navigate where you take that conversation to push on those pain points and then really get the buy-in from that individual. So listen first and then apply. And what are some of the things that may happen within the coaching relationship that would kill that relationship pretty quickly? Because I think for anybody working with getting that opportunity, what can kill that relationship pretty quickly? Because I'm sure that the trust is gained, but it goes very quick as well. Very much so. I think on the front end, you need to set some clear expectations. You need to identify you know, what the goals are with the athlete or client that you're working with. And then, as I say, put the steps in place to reach them. But you have to say, look, I'm going to bring my best self every single time. These are my standards. And are you on board or are you not on board with these? Because unless you do that on the front end, Mark, then how can you expect six, eight weeks later down the line, if they're not adhering to those standards, if you haven't voiced them, how can you expect them to adhere to them and just, just, presume that they know what you represent and what you're about. It's something I do in business now and going back to the kind of standards is, I laughed yesterday, I put something on the socials, it was about three minute long voice notes, I don't know if you saw. And um, I actually in business, in every arm of my business, I set a rule early on on the front end, you're not allowed to leave more than a 60 second voice note. And that might sound to some listeners, you're crazy, what, look, I'm just that busy, but I cannot deal with someone who leaves me a three minute long voice note even if it is on 1.5 speed. But I say that early on. If I didn't say that, and I'm just like a volcano, it's building, it's building, it's building, I'm I'm getting, um, you know, getting the hump with the people who are leaving me three minute long voice notes, but I haven't even voiced that to them. I haven't let them know. Mm -hmm. So as long as you have some clear standards on the front end that you can voice that with someone and then shake their hand on it and say, are we in this together? Are we gonna reach this outcome together? This is just my minimum expectation. If you have something as well, remember it's collaboration, it's not a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I do do with the athletes, Mark, is 
allow them to bring what they can to the conversation. And also what I will do, and I hope none of the athletes are listening, is I will have an outcome that I want to reach, but make them think that they've reached that outcome by what they're doing. So that for me is the art of coaching as well, is to make sure it's collaboration and not just a dictatorship. That's that's fantastic. And how do you keep hold of the professional coach relationship with people who maybe develop a social relationship with you? This is a, this is a big thing in the professional world, especially if say corporate or athletes. Like, you know, and this whole podcast, this episode for me really is giving a lot of insight, a huge insight into coaches that aspire or coaches that are in that world right now, but wanting to work with more people. How do you maintain that coach and client relationship? That's a great question, Mark. And that's something that, you know, I don't go out much with friends. I'm very immersed in my business and I absolutely class my athletes as friends now because I spend a lot of my time with them and our values are very aligned and they've put their trust in me. So for that alone means that they've got my respect and trust as well. And, you know, I can hand on heart say I've got friendships with with my athletes now, but that doesn't mean I'm going out getting drunk with them. That doesn't mean my standards get lowered because of that. Because the do you concern- have rules around that, by the way? If I can maybe jump in, do you have rules for yourself on on how long you may go out to a social function? Absolutely. I mean, if you win huge championships, I think it's yeah. I think there was one actually. Funny enough, Mark, we um, we were out in Las Vegas with Josh Taylor, who became undisputed champion. I think I saw well. that. <laughs> yeah. That, but to be honest, that was you know professionalism is as you well know probably one of the highest standards that I have. And there was a video on socials on a story, and we've spoken about this, Mark, is this to, to let my guard down, which I need to do a little bit more and show the real Dan Lawrence at times. Um, and it was after Josh became undisputed champion of the world in Las Vegas. I think we were walking through a casino or one of the hotels there. And we'd had a couple of drinks to toast uh, the victory. And uh, I put it on my Instagram story. And, and Josh is a very funny, lovely guy. And he was saying something, I think he was doing a impersonation of me. And, we joke now about is all about the outcomes and the uh, and uh, yeah it was it was something that went out there and that for me was something that I'm not ashamed of saying you know it, it was just a monumental moment um, but it doesn't then mean the next week I'm, I'm having drinks with him again that was a complete one off so for me yeah look if there is any social occasion then I, I don't drink anyway really um, so I just need to be mindful and I think for those listening is mindful of what those boundaries are because mm-hmm. it'd be very hard then for you to go into the gym three days later and have you know Mr. Professional hat on because I think you do dilute what you're representing a little bit. Yeah, no, I, think, I think that's an important thing for everyone to take away because I think that it's very easy to get in that environment and feel that the most important thing you can do is become so friendly that it crosses over that line to being too social Definitely. And I think on that mark as well is when you have your standards in place and clarity with the standards and you voice those standards, if they start slipping, then they need to be addressed as well. I would say that. So you you voice them on the front end. But if, for example, a few of those or one or two of those are then not being met by the athlete or the client, I do believe you're well within your right and you absolutely should have a conversation with them to say, look, Mm. this was our agreement on the front end. I have noticed of late and not the first time they turn up three minutes late because of traffic, you know, but if, for example, a couple of times they they have turned up 12, 15 minutes late to an in-person appointment, the first time you might let it go. The second time you say, look, Mark, you know, I, I let it go last time, but on this date, you turn up this at this time. You told me about it at the time. I didn't address it. But now this has happened again. I just feel like I need to for the greater good of the relationship because I really value the work that we're doing. We're on this journey together. We shook our hands on the front end to become world champion that I need to say this, you know, what's going on? I'm sorry, coach, like that, that won't happen again. Boom. And I think that's, that's really, really important is that you remained in control. Yeah. Rather than allowing the relationship to kind of slide. And that's key. And that's key, especially with the elite level athletes. And that's, yeah, it is. And it's, something that it can be hard because you don't yeah you know they they do have egos they do have profiles and and things as well but fundamentally if you lose that respect if you lose being the coach then you lose the success of the relationship long term dan this has been an incredible conversation i want to leave anybody watching or listening with this today 
with kind of three things that you do every single day that you've done for a long time now that you think are most responsible for where you are today. Great talking again, Mark. Firstly, thanks for having me back. And uh, I have something we call win the day. And uh, we did it with a footballer actually at the time and uh, we were rehabbing him and his longer term goal of getting back over the white line and playing football again was like 12 weeks away. He was way too far. Mm -hmm. We started talking about that. He would have become demoralized and dragged his heels. So we just focus on the here and now. We knew what we wanted to achieve longer term. Of course, we have to have that outcome based goal, but we just focus on winning the day. And what that looks like for me personally now is... Um, daily non-negotiables. So I have clear daily non-negotiables that I adhere to every single day. They might be no Netflix before 7 p.m. because I know if I did start watching Netflix, it's not aligned with my goal. Training in some capacity, you know, whether that's mobility work in the morning or, you know, throwing some weights around, some light weights around in the gym. Um, nutrition, I map out my nutrition every single day, you know, not to the gram. Don't use my fitness pal, but at least I know roughly where I'm at from a nutritional point of view because that, again, fuels my brain, fuels my body and is aligned with my goals. I speak to my mum every night before bed because that again is aligned with my core values. And um, so yeah, having daily non-negotiables, winning the day, having my day planned the evening prior is of the utmost importance as well. So I'll map out my day and some may listen to this and think oh, that's such a rigid approach. But for me, it needs to be to be a high performer and to execute mm -hmm. on the tasks that I have. So I'll have my gym kit ready the evening before. I'll make my bed in the morning, which you know some might laugh at and, and say, well, that's a load of BS. I know Alex or Mosey said that of late, but for me, it's a standard, you know, and it sets a stall for stacking wins. Wins build momentum. Repeat, repeat, repeat. There you go. And then repeat. you look at the end result of where you're at, mm. and it is the result of the last 17 years of doing what you've done consistently. Yeah. And I think that, you know, you talked just then about other people's opinions on, you know, should you get up at 5 a.m.? Should you make your bed? Well, at the end of the day, if you're not succeeding and other people are and try it and it works for you, mm. but if you are already succeeding in the things that you're doing that they've worked for a long time, then that's your system. That's your structure. Okay. I think like you said, you've got to have your own version of your own non-negotiables. Absolutely. And, win the day. and I think that's key for, for any listeners is that maybe disregard some of the things I'm saying, but there may be one or two things that you might bring into your own routines and be a sponge and absorb that. It's not that you have to do exactly what I'm saying or exactly what another individual's saying. Mm -hmm. It's got to be, you know, it's got to have context and it's got to have uh, be aligned to what you do on a day-to-day -day basis that will then, you know, get you closer to your goals. So um, yeah, like the making of the bed and, and things like that for me is how you do one thing is how you do everything. And those little things that on a single, done as a single entity, they won't mean anything, yeah. but they do start building a bit of momentum. Well, listen, again, it has been incredibly value, valuable to have you on. One of the few people we've had on twice on the podcast. Um, so I, I say this on behalf of the listeners and myself. Thank you very much for sparing your time. I know you're here to enjoy and work your time in Dubai. Um, but just for everybody else who's listening and watching, how can anybody find you? Again, thanks for having me, Mark. Great to talk as ever. And uh, Instagram is probably the best place. So uh, the handle is at perform365. And uh, yeah, good talking today. Amazing. Well, listen, guys, please do me a favor. Click like, click subscribe. If you are watching the YouTube channel right now, if you are listening on iTunes and you have any questions, you want to reach out, please just go to the link in my bio on Instagram, Mark Holes M10. And for now, Dan, I thank you so much. We'll speak to you, speak to you guys soon.